good afternoon everyone thank you for uh, joining the corporate tax webinar uh, conducted by hlb hand tax and regulatory compliance department this session is not going to be an informative session on the corporate tax law this is going to be about uh, the recent updates that has come in the form of ministerial decisions cabinet decisions and fta decisions which is going to have a, a good impact on most of the companies and everyone should be aware of okay these are the areas that we need to be uh, we need to be aware of so that if any uh, such related activities or any kind of uh, transactions are happening in our company then we should know okay this is what is going to impact us so this is just an overview of how the ministerial decisions are trying to you know uh, cover each and every taxable uh, persons into their ambit uh, secondly uh, there are other important areas also like gar provision the poem that we just wanted to have a hint over uh, based on the current uh, based on the structures based on the company organization in uh, in ua there are ua nationals who own multiple companies in ua outside ua so we just wanted to give a highlight over that also how the poem implications are going to be on uh, you know most of the companies in ua and we need to assess that angle also when it comes to corporate tax so let me uh, introduce to our senior partner, Mr. Jay Krishnan, who is uh, heading the Tax and Regulatory Compliance Department of HLB HAMD. Uh, myself, uh, Girish Nair, uh, I'm the manager of Tax and Regulatory Compliance Department. And we are looking after the uh, tax aspects uh, right from VAT, excise tax, uh, corporate tax, ESR, and transfer pricing uh, compliances. So, Moving forward, I'll just like to have some word from Mr. Jay Krishnan uh, uh, for some inputs before we start the session. Yeah, thank you, Girish. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for joining with our webinar. Uh, it's been quite a long time since the last webinar was conducted because we were awaiting some you know, important guidelines or, or you know, announcement from the ministry. Recently, we started getting it. And then most of the days we started getting, you know, the, the important topics or developments from corporate tax angle from FTA. So we thought this is the right time that so far we have received almost 20, 30 announcement, be it cabinet decisions or ministerial decisions or FTA announcement, whatever it may be related to corporate taxes. We thought this is the right time to give you an update on, on you know, the, the developments so far. Uh, so that is the reason for today's webinar. And Girish will, you know, take the topics. We are not covering the whole corporate tax now. Instead, we will be focusing on important areas where the development, the, the recent development has come from various authorities in, in, in the Emirate. Yeah. So once Girish explain about it, I will also be in, in, in the loop. I'm, I'm also going to add my suggestions and points into that. And uh, we will take it as an interactive session. And towards the end, we will give you sufficient time for, you know, posting your questions and queries. Uh, I, in fact, you can start posting your questions right after starting the session, but uh, Girish will take the questions before we end up the session. And again, thank you once again for joining another session. Girish, you can go ahead now. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So starting from the first uh, thing, Tomorrow onwards, the corporate tax is going to be effective for, for applicable for companies based on their financial year. In UAE, we have companies who follow June, May financial year, July, June financial year. So whosoever is following June, May financial year, from tomorrow onwards, whatever transactions are going, they are going to take, uh, they are going to conduct, uh, that will be covered under the corporate tax ambit. Uh, most of the companies in UAE follow calendar year. So once again, everyone knows, just for a heads up, uh, Jan to December, those who are following the calendar year as their financial year, for them, it will be applicable from 2024. So talking about ministerial decisions, we have received over 15 uh, ministerial decisions. Today also three ministerial decisions were published uh, related to business restructuring, transfer within a qualifying group, and one of the important decisions is how to, how to determine the taxable income. Uh, that also decision is published uh, uh, today afternoon. And we have received a copy of that. We need to just go through that so that, that those three decisions won't be covered in this. The remaining decisions which we received till yesterday, would be covered the most important ones those would be covered so uh, the first important ministerial decision that we need to discuss is the cabinet decision 85 of 2022 regarding the tax residency was introduced in 2022 towards the end of the 2022 so pertaining to that there were certain rules 
which needs to be affirmed by the government. So they published another ministerial decision, uh, now number 27. So this basically, and this is effective from March 1, 2023. So this basically speaks about, most importantly, about the natural person, the residency guidelines for them. Earlier, there was a by default guideline, okay, 183 days or more, anyone is staying, they are by default the tax residents of U, tax resident of UAE. But now they have added more conditions to it. And that 183 days is was uh, for within uh, 12 consecutive months, for 12 consecutive months, within 12 consecutive months, 183 days must be, the person must be physically present. Apart from that, they have stated another condition. Even if a uh, natural person, an individual, stays 90 days within a period of 12 months, and other conditions along with the 90 days, he can be a, he should be a UA national or he should hold a valid residence permit or he should be a nationality of any GCC state. And he should be having, a, what to say, a permanent place of residence in UAE or an employment or a business in UAE. So if all these conditions are met by staying in 90 days and by holding either of the three, uh, what to say, residence status as a UAE national, as a, a holder of a valid residential permit and nationality of any GCC member state, along with that, having a place of establishment, a place of uh, business in uh, UAE or a residence in UAE or employment in UAE, the person will be categorized as a tax resident in UAE. So this is very important for the natural persons. And uh, the place of residence can include his usual or primary place of residence where he's staying, from where he's uh, commuting day and uh, day uh, to and fro to other business to other places. So that will be treated as a normal primary place of business. Uh, to some extent, we also need to look into if he's not having a place of place of residence. So from where the financial and personal interests are being executed by the natural person, uh, is he having a lot of social relations? Where uh, where it is located, all that we need to evaluate when we are considering the tax residency of an individual in UAE. So this is effective from March 1, 2023. So whenever we are talking about tax residency for an individual, for our owners, for our key management persons, then we should be looking into this angle. Uh, Mr. JK, I would like to have an opinion from you uh, regarding on this. Uh, uh, what are the main uh, areas other than what we have discussed right now? Which are the angle that we need to look into? Yes. See the, the the this is the major change of you know tax residency rule, 183 days staying in 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 12 months calendar uh, months was the eligibility period for you know getting a, a tax residency letter or tax residency in the country. Now that has been amended to 90 days with some conditions which Giris already explained, either a UA national or a work permit or a GCC national whatever, and there are other some associated conditions as well. But if you see that you know that that amendment and now the, the 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 issue is after the announcement of the corporate tax regulations the corporate tax law if you read it in, in many of the pages we can see the residency uh, resident resident non-resident you know concept so uh, earlier 183 days was the, the 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 number of days to qualify for the residential status but now since this is amended to 90 days with some conditions associated people uh, staying, natural person or an individual who stays in the country for more than 90 days and, and having some other conditions associated will be qualified as a, as a tax resident. So how is it going to impact the corporate tax? That is a question. So being an, a, a resident of the country, the question is, you know, an individual or the owners of a company or anybody who stay in the country and then earns income outside country, outside the UAE. That is a question. That is a trigger point where we need to be more care, careful now. As per the law, an individual or a tax resident who, who is earning income, you know, in UAE is definitely that is going to be taxed in the country. But what about the income he earns outside the country? As per the current announcement, this is also going to be taxed in the country, you know, but there are some deductions, allowances, but end of the day, we have to ensure that the income earned outside UAE is also falling into the purview of corporate tax for a resident person living in the country. But again, when I say, is it going to be taxed in this UAE or not, it's a different question, but it should be disclosed. It should be you know, shown in your return and then you have to take all the computation calculations. So that is the impact. So the, 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 we should be careful as an owner of a company or anybody who is having you know, that residential status should ensure that we, we have disclosed the revenue generated out of UAE. See, as per the, the corporate tax law, it was mentioning earlier that any revenue generated from the country, if, you know, is going to be taxed that's for sure but other than uae outside uae is going to be taxed if it is related to the business conducted in the country 
imagine a case that you you conduct a business totally different from what is conducted in the country emirate is it going to be taxed in in, in uae or not uh, technically no the answer would be no but there could be some disclosure requirement on on about the foreign uh, income uh, which is going to be you know the, the the in the computation time we have to disclose those kind of transactions that is what we feel but the ministerial decision is not very clear on how to the procedural aspects are not very clear as of now on how to disclose and declare those kind of income but again the question is we have to analyze ourselves whether we are a resident of the uae or not if yes then we have to ensure all those you know disclosure requirements are met that is the, the impact of this announcement rest everything remains safe thank you mr jk so moving on to the next uh, important so uh, ministerial decision on small business relief now through this uh, business relief the uh, corporate tax is giving benefit for uh, small businesses whose annual revenue is more than is less than 3 million so this has to be evaluated in two tax periods in the previous tax period and the current tax period so that means if a business is having a revenue less than 3 million for two consecutive tax periods then they can avail the small business relief so this is a very welcome move by the uh, tax authority and ministry and the tax authorities they you know they wanted to give relief mostly for the grocery stores the saloons the uh, what to say other small flower shops and all who are doing a business of less than 3 million so to make them exempt they had to uh, not exempt is the correct word but they have given a relief but they have to get registered they have to file the tax returns and they have to claim the relief through the tax returns so declaration through tax return is going to be there they are not exempted from that so once again small business relief claiming persons have to register have to file the tax returns and then you know claim the relief so this is not applicable to a member or a company who is part of an mne group mne group we are from here whenever we are talking about in corporate tax or today's session when when we are talking about mne group we want to make it very clear that the mne group means a, a group whose global consolidated turnover is more than 3.15 billion dirhams 750 million euros who are subject to the beb section plan pillar 2 so if any company is a member of that particular group for them the small business relief cannot be taken even if the revenue is less than 3 million and a qualifying free zone person so a free zone person again it's a very uh, good area but then uh, there are certain benefits available to the free zone persons but there are certain conditions to be achieved so for a free zone person to be treated as a qualifying free zone person there are conditions which will be prescribed in the cabinet decision which everyone is awaiting but no one has received the decision till date so we are still waiting for that and uh, we were believing that today being the tomorrow from tomorrow the corporate tax is being effective formally uh, officially today the cabinet decision on free zone should be com coming out but it has not come out so maybe we can expect maybe on thursday or friday they can come with that so a small business relief claiming person there are certain tax loss relief available to taxable persons as per the corporate tax law then there are certain limitations available uh, uh, on interest deductions so all those uh, reliefs and deductions available may be limited to a certain extent so interest deduction limit can be claimed certain percentage in the current period and the uh, remaining percentage can be carried forward but when you are claiming a small business relief that carry forward option will not be available so such kind of restrictions are there when you are claiming a small business relief this threshold is applicable from tomorrow onwards for financial year starting from 1st june 2023 and this will be applicable till the financial year ending on 31st december 2026 the tax period ending on 2020 uh, december 30 december uh, 31st 2026 again most importantly they have specified in the cap in the ministerial decision on small business relief is artificial suppression of business so let's assume we are having a business of less than uh we are having a business of uh, 10 million uh, dirhams uh, worth revenue to claim the relief if we are uh, dividing the business into three different licenses and then bringing down it less than 3 million in some way then that will be constituted as a artificial suppression of business to take the benefit of the relief which will attract the gar provision the general anti abuse rule provision that we are going to touch the general anti abuse rule provision towards the end so these are the areas that we need to uh, understand for small business relief 
Mr. JK, I, I would like to just have an opinion of you. Uh, what should the company do, or how the company can, you know, uh, take the uh, how the company should decide that they should be taking a claim, benefit of small business relief? Yeah, see, this this chapter needs a clear analysis. It depends on group to group, company to company. Yeah, three million threshold is per company. So the question comes mostly on grouping. When you decide or when we plan for grouping of entities. Uh, we might lose this threshold option of 3 million because the reason being, once it is grouped, grouped uh, that grouped entity will be considered as one of the taxable person. So the total consolidated turnover will be considered for that purpose, which is going to be automatically more than 3 million. So we will lose that uh, SME, small and, and medium sized entities uh, relief option if we choose to you know, group it, if the turnover is less than 3 million. So uh, we don't recommend the company to be grouped you know, if you wanted to claim the, the small business relief of 3 million, that is one important decision we have to analyze. Apart from that, like Girish mentioned, interest carry forward option must be, uh, these are going to be lapsed if we go for grouping. So grouping is one of the topic where, you know, the, the threshold is going to touch. So uh, other than that, I don't think any, any see, it, it, it's, it's, it's a good move from the FTA or from the ministry side you know, to give relief to the small and, and medium-sized entities whose turnover, turnover is less than 3 million. So in, in, in our group, if we have entities, less than the turnover always, we don't recommend to group it. And because this is not mandatory that it should be group. Grouping is our option. So basically we can take a call by looking the turnover of the companies to group or not. If you group, we are going to lose that uh, small relief, uh, you know, 3 million uh, cap. That is the main impact of this uh, decision. Other than that, it's, it's, it's a good move. And as Girish was mentioning, see, GAR is an important provision. So artificial separation of companies only for the tax evasion, for the tax saving, and, and then splitting the turnover of the company into two company or three companies together is going to attract the, the, the anti-abuse rule, which is a crime as per the law. So we don't recommend to do that. And uh, yeah, that's it. These are the, the impact of uh, small business relief. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Jacob. Now, through cabinet decision, uh, ministerial decision number 43, there are certain exceptions given to tax registration. So whichever entities you're seeing below, the government entity, government controlled entity, uh, person engaged in extractive business, extractive business means the oil and natural resource business, oil and natural resource extractive business, non-extractive natural resource business means who support the extractive business, and then non-resident person that derives only state sourced. That means the UA source income and does not have a PE. So all the type of uh, entities that are uh, persons that are listed below are not required to apply for corporate tax registration. Apart from this, all types of companies must apply for registration. For example, it can be a loss making company. It can be below the taxable income threshold company, small business relief company, uh, other exempt persons, this government entity, government control entity come into the exempt category. Article four states the exempt person list. So there are some exempt persons who are completely exempted from registration itself. So they don't have to get registered. They don't have to file the tax returns. But if uh, what to say other persons, other exempt persons in the exempt list, they have to get registered, but then there are certain uh, that we will be discussing in the coming slide. So a company having a loss, company having a profit below the threshold, small business relief company, uh, claiming company, uh, free zone company, and offshore company, everyone will have to get registered. No one is other than the list is exempted from corporate tax registration. Another important decision that came uh, is who should be maintaining, who should be preparing and maintaining audited financial statements. So they have given a very high limit wherein so taxable person whose revenue is more than 50 million dirhams, only they should be preparing and maintaining audited financial statements or a qualifying free zone person. This is with respect to the corporate tax law. So if any other law asks for maintaining audited financial statements, then we have to maintain. So when a person is looked at from corporate tax angle, then a, a person who is having a revenue of more than 50 million dirhams, they must be maintaining a audited, they must be preparing financial statements and then get it audited. Similarly for qualifying free zone persons, there are free zone companies, there are free zones who are mand who mandatorily need audited financial statements. 
and there are some free zones who don't go for uh, financial uh, statements and even they don't want to they do, they, they they don't mandate to get it audited so now onwards even a free zone company who wants to take the benefit of 0% tax rate they must get their financials audited so this is a very important and a welcome move by the tax authorities and the ministry this is very important which we need to know but it requires a lot of introspection and discussion but we are just touching the area and letting you know so cap, uh, ministerial decision number 83 prescribes the conditions which, under which the natural person in the state would not create a pe a permanent establishment so for example a non resident person came to uh, ua and is staying for a certain period of time maybe is exceeding the period of 183 or certain other conditions which we may feel that okay now he has created a pe in ua so there are certain conditions which will not create a pe this is what we are discussing in the uh, below the conditions whatever it is listed so the presence is due to an exceptional circumstance that exceptional circumstance can be of public nature or a private nature now public nature as everyone two years back everyone faced the covid restrictions flight restrictions travel restrictions were there so because of that if any restrictions which is applicable to the general public if that happens and because of that a non resident person happens to be in ua we cannot establish that a pe is formed because he has been forcefully stayed because of some certain uh, restrictions or certain guidelines certain sanctions uh, which is applicable to the public in general so because of that uh, what to say the person will not be creating a pe similarly of private nature maybe after visiting in the ua that person uh, got some emergency health conditions or of, of his relative himself or any of his relative up to fourth degree of a relation that includes even a relation by way of adoption and guardianship so all this reasons private of private nature and public nature because of that if a person if a non resident person is staying in ua then that will not create a pe for the purpose of corporate tax now the except this kind of uh, this kind of exceptional circumstances which we discuss in the above line it cannot be predicted no one can predict right any sanctions or travel restrictions any health conditions so this these are the reasons that we should be assessing whether such conditions or such reasons are why the person is staying in ua or not and the natural person after the restrictions are over or after the exception circumstance cease to exist or stops then he does not intend to stay in ua anymore he will be traveling back to his uh, home country or any other jurisdiction so that itself will not create a p so these are the areas that we need to look into when we are having a connected natural person or any other person who is coming into ua and then uh, we may think that okay a pe is created in a ue or not because of the person's presence in ue so mr jk i would like to uh, have some opinion from you uh, what are the risk areas or what are the areas the companies need to look into when it comes to uh, any of their related persons or any person from outside ue coming to uh, ue yeah this this announcement 83 of 2023 talks about you know presence of a natural person in the state so this is uh, mostly pointing to towards a natural person so when you say natural person who is a non resident who is traveling to the country emirate and then you know if you read the conditions associated you know certain uh, reasons so if we fall into that reasons or excuses then of course there is no pe uh, as per the formal pe will not be triggered if not if not then would the, the impact would be he will be considered or this this residents or the 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 persons stay in the country will be considered as a permanent establishment which is the problem would be what if he is established as a pe that is a question in the corporate tax law as i mentioned in the first slide an individual who is considered or if he is earning revenue in the country in emirate and if he is having pe in the country then this is 100% taxable in this emirate if not if there is no pe and if he earns income from uae this is considered in a different topic different chapter which is totally different rule this is called the withholding tax provision so if he establishes himself that he is falling into a pe provision then of course his income is subject to the full tax 9% tax in emirate that is the, the the difference or that is the impact of this announcement so anybody who stay in the country you know after reading the the, the below conditions or this slides conditions and if he is not falling into those conditions then automatically permanent establishment triggers and then he is going to be taxed in the emirate for those income which is generated in 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 the emirate in uae that is the impact otherwise temporary stay if we qualify with all these provisions 
and even if you earn some income in the country then 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 that is not going to be taxed at 9 percentage instead that is going to be taxed at uh, the the withholding tax provisions based on the withholding tax provisions that is the impact of this particular topic thank you thank you mr jk thank you Another important ministerial decision that came was regarding that maintaining transfer pricing documentation. So along with the law, with the introduction of uh, transfer pricing compliance, uh, you know, maintaining of master file and local file. So everyone was concerned whether they would be required to maintain master file or not. So with this ministerial decision, it is made very clear. So where the taxable person is a constituent member of the MNE group. Again, we have, this, we have discussed what MNE group is. It is a group with a global consolidated turnover of more than 3.15 billion dirhams or 750 million euros. And uh, what to say, uh, they are part of this web section plan pillar too. And the second category of persons who are required to maintain transfer pricing documentation where the, trans where the taxable person's revenue is more than 200 million dirhams. So this is a very generous uh, limit that they have kept. In other tax jurisdictions, the limit is somewhere around 10 million or 50 million or uh, like that. So there's a 200 million uh, taxable uh, persons uh, revenue limit is a very generous. So only this category, these two category of persons are required to maintain transfer pricing documentation that is maintaining of master file and local file. Just to highlight, this does not mean that we should not be following or this or the entities who are not required to maintain TP documentation should not be following arms length principle. We are expecting another cabinet decision or a ministerial decision on that. So they may be keeping a limit on that also. For example, a transaction up to X amount of value, then only you should be following the arm's length principle. So we are still waiting for the cabinet decision because article uh, 34 on arm's length principle clause one states that uh, you know other conditions will be specified in the cabinet decision. So we are still waiting for that when it comes to arm's length principle. So as of now, below 200 million or you be in a constituent member of 3.15 billion dirhams or not you are required to follow the arms length principle documentation part is very clear arms length principle must be followed so we are waiting for the decisions on that and uh, adding on to that uh, Grish, i just wanted to highlight one point see 200 million sure. 200 million yeah. is a result like turnover threshold for maintaining the, the local file master file systems as Girish yeah. mentioned benchmarking and uh, maintenance of other set of documents for the transfer pricing is mandatory as of now, unless and until the, the FTA or the ministry comes up with a different regulation or cap that you should not maintain, you know, below this uh, uh, threshold turnover. But as of now, we are awaiting that. Uh, see, the, the, the problem is, again, 200 million is the turnover of a taxable person. So if you take a decision to consolidate or, or group it, so the impact would be, uh, you know, the, the automatically the maintenance, the mandatory maintenance of the local file, master file will be triggered if your total consolidated turnover is following more than 200 million. So, uh, see, the, the maintenance of master file, local file is not a big issue, but, you know, since it is new in the country, we have to go through all those processes, the, the, the full benchmarking should be conducted. So, all those regulations, full compliance of the transfer pricing needs to be done if your turnover is more than 200 million. So, my point is, the grouping is an important decision. Before that, we should take into consideration all these regulations, the, the, even the trans, including transfer pricing. Because we, if we group it and the, the, the group turnover is going to be more than 200 million, the mandatory uh, maintenance of the master file, local file, and all the, the full, full compliance needs to be ensured for the transfer price. That is going to be the impact if we group it. Otherwise, it's a very liberal approach from the ministry side that up to 200 million is a good amount of value. Many of the companies will be falling out of maintenance of the uh, local and master file requirements in the country. So rest of the procedures, we are waiting the, the, the decision from ministry. So once that is announced, it will be very clear, you know, what are the set of documents to be maintained to, to, to ensure that we are complete in terms of uh, transfer pricing law is concerned. Okay, yeah. So there are certain requirements of, you know, um, master file is generally prepared by the parent company or the head, uh, head office like that. Local file is prepared by other companies who are taking the transactions or who are having related party transactions. So local file, there are certain uh, transact related party transactions that must be shown in the local file. There are certain related party transactions that need not be shown in the local file. So if you are, if you, if you are having a related party that is a non-resident person or it is an exempt person under the Article 4 of the Corporate Tax Law, if the related party is a 
a person who has claimed for the small business relief and if the resident person is subject to a different corporate tax rate maybe 0% still you would be required to include that in the local file so again this is applicable only to the companies for whom the maintenance of master file and local file is applicable so they should be taking care what all they should be including in the local file and the right hand side includes what not to be included in the local file so other than transactions so, uh, with the resident persons who are not an exempt person not who has not claimed small business relief and who are not uh, opting for a different tax rate who are not uh, who are not falling into the different tax bracket uh, they they should not be included in the local file and uh, other uh, listings are also given so this is where we need to analyze how the local file has to be prepared what all transactions we need to look into so this also emphasizes on the fact that how our accounting system needs to be configured or how our accounting system can identify what all relate what all are the transactions with our related party and which all related and which category it falls into is it a non related on non resident person transaction or is it a person with my related party who has opted for a small business relief how are we going to trans how are we going to record or how are we going to identify such transactions at the time of preparing the local file so this is a very important area so accounting configurations uh, or chart of account reconfiguration might be required in such cases Uh, so this is what we need to evaluate maintaining of local file once you do it it is very simple but before that the exercise to equip yourself to have a proper local file to be prepared is where we need to take care so an assessment and proper changes implementation uh, evaluation of the implementation methods everything needs to be very firmly assessed when it comes to you know maintaining tp documentation and the contents in the tp documentation now through cabinet uh, ministerial decision number 114 the accounting standards and methods who should be following accounting standards what kind of accounting standards should be followed they just give a, they have given a guideline we are summarizing it so cash basis of accounting can be uh, followed by the uh, taxable person whose revenue is less than 3 million and exceptions can be uh, obtained by applying to the authority so they will based on the authority's approval even some uh, some companies or some taxable persons may be having a revenue of more than 3 million but they can apply to the tax authority saying that the nature of the business for example let's assume a grocery shop they are always doing dealing on a cash basis credit uh, cash to credit ratio is very uh, credit to cash ratio is very less when it comes to grocery shops so but they may be earning more than 5 million for example so they can apply to the tax authority to exempt them from maintaining financial statements on any accounting and basis and to allow them to make maintain on cash basis other than the above exceptions all the taxable persons must apply ifrs or the relevant accounting standards again a relief is given from ifrs point of view if the taxable persons revenue is less than 50 million dirhams they can opt to apply ifrs which is applicable to smes small and medium enterprises so ifrs again there is a full fledged ifrs which is applicable across you can opt for that the companies with a revenue of less than 50 million they can opt for the full ifrs and again they are given the option to opt for ifrs which is applicable only to smes so this uh, area where uh, mr jaykrishan has having a good expertise on analysis of the financial statements in the past in relation to ifrs applicable full ifrs and the ifrs on smes so i would like to just have an opinion and uh, your uh, concurrence on certain matters where uh, how the uh, assessment needs to be done uh, whether a company should be opting for full fledge ifrs or a ifrs just applicable to smes see i don't say it's a complicated topic but it's moving towards a complicated situation that they permit the entities to choose either of them so the smes ifrs or you know the full ifrs is a optional now it is not mandatory that you should follow either of one so you can choose but once you establish you should follow applying that consistently that's what the law says the question is you know what are the difference between sme ifrs and the regular full ifrs there are various you know difference in in treatment and then the, the measurement of the, the transactions into the accounting systems and financial statements in both the ifrss but uh, what i understand is ifrs for smes under uh, you know revision and then the global authorities are going to issue the, the new sme ifrs in the in the you know in very uh, i think it's in the final stage now that is what i understand but i don't have a final version of that but what i understand is if you follow smes there are some liberal approaches in the, in the sme ifrs for sme including 
say i i would like to highlight one example interest interest capitalization interest you know incurred on any capital asset before the the installation or before the the, the implementation of the specific asset as per the full ifrs you have to you know there are options to to capitalize it or to charge it as an expenses and in the in the SMEs, you know, you have to mandatorily show it as an expenses in the financial statement, and there is no option to capitalize it. So that is going to impact heavily on the on the, on the profitability of the company. So interest amount should be completely expensed out as per the SMEs IFRS. That is one example I am talking about. Similarly, when it takes to the fair valuation, yeah, fair valuation and the impairment testing. Impairment testing is almost similar, but fair valuation is you know totally different in in in, in SME IFRS. Whereas you know in IFRS we have a certain set of rules and procedures we have to follow for the fair valuation. So the the the, the problem is if you choose or if you decide to choose SME IFRS, and and the same entity if someone chooses for the full IFRS, the profitability and the balance sheet is going to be totally different. I'm not telling totally different. There are chances that it might be heavily impacted in terms of the numbers because the measurement in in both the the IFRS regulations are totally different. So what our challenge in terms of the corporate tax is, see, we have to plan ourselves, which one is more, you know, easier, which one is more, going to be more tax effective for our entities or our group of entities. And then accordingly, we have to choose the, the IFRS because in the country, in the Emirates, there is no mandatory regulation that you should follow certain IFRS. This, you can choose either of them, either full IFRS or the SME IFRS. And the auditors, when we do the audit, we don't have any issues, you know, even if you follow SMEs for the smaller, I mean, IFRS for SMEs, uh, so it all depends on what is going to be, you know, more uh, tax effective in terms of the corporate tax and other regulations in the country. So, so that assessment, that is going to be a separate assessment. And we need to be careful while doing the assessment. And then we have to tabulate and assess and what is the, the, the best mechanism or best type for us to be followed in our entity. But mostly 99% or, or I would say now in, in HLB, in our client list, you know, 90 plus 90 percentage plus companies are following the full IFRS. Uh, because of the various banking and, and you know, large size entities prefer always work with IFRS so that there is no, you know, reconciliation required when a banker or any financial institution or any, any, any external agencies are asking, how do you compute it? What is the difference between an IFRS for big IFRS and a small IFRS? So basically, they to avoid all these headaches, they follow the full IFRS. But going forward, there would be a tendency to choose the, the small SMEs IFRS, which needs a thorough analysis before we opt it. That's what this the regulation says. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jake. That was very uh, helpful. Thank you. Now, another cabinet uh, ministerial decision, uh, 116, which uh, touches the uh, participation exemption part. This is also a very important area, but uh, this requires a lot of introspection and understanding on certain areas. So participation exemption generally allows entities who are having certain percentage of holding for more than 12 months in certain entities they can whatever uh, income is generated from such uh, holding such participation it will be exempted from corporate tax so to evaluate whether we are a, we are whether we can take the participation exemption benefit of participation exemption we need to evaluate the shareholding structure where they have uh, where they have uh, where they are having the participating interest uh, the tax rates applicable to the participation that means where the part where the investment is done that entities applicable tax rate everything needs to be evaluated what is the business activity of that uh, participation all needs to be evaluated to claim the benefit of uh, to uh, to confirm whether participation exemption can be claimed and whether it can be claimed or not so uh, at least five percent should be held for a continuous period of 12 months and that 5% holding should not be just a like a sleeping partner or just someone, uh, you know, just holding the ownership. There should be some degree of control or influence in the decision making or at least a voting right in the participation. So what kind of ownership interest will be eligible for participation exemption? So ordinary shares, preferred shares, redeemable shares, any other sort of membership or uh, partner interest where maybe a certain share may be allocated to you. So that will also include our participation exemption category and any other type of security which give you an entitlement to the profit share and the liquidation proceeds. So both should be available by holding, by holding 5% or by holding a certain value of 
participation interest in the participation you should be eligible not only for the profits but also for the liquidation proceeds so uh, the ownership interest should be uh, you know should uh, make you eligible to earn both the benefits this kind this participation exemption is in the corporate tax law it was stated that 5 percentage or more that is already there again in the article 23 clause 11 they clearly stated that instead of that 5 percent if certain value is also maintained or if certain value of ownership is on trust is there that person can also claim a participation interest uh, participation exemption benefit so that value is 4 million so if a person is owning maybe less than 3 million uh, less than 3 percentage of the ownership interest in the participation but if the value is 4 million or more still he can take the participation exemption so this is the uh, most important part that we need to look into from the participation exemption angle so just giving an example uh, now as you saw in the previous slide the different types of uh, interests are there ordinary shares preferred shares redeemable shares like that so for example if a taxable person xyz llc is holding three percent ordinary shares so this is below the 5% limit, you will say, no, this participation exemption is not available. So along with 3% ordinary share, let's assume that XYZ LLC is holding 7% preferred share also. So aggregation of the different types of ownership interest is holding more than 10% interest on an aggregation basis. So that will give rise to, what to say, uh, eligibility for claiming the participation exemption. Again, uh, holding preferred shares and uh, there should be a continuous period of uh, uh, what to say the ownership interest being held for a continuous period of 12 months or more so for seven months i was holding preferred shares and after seven months i gave that preferred shares in exchange of that i got the ordinary shares in the same participation so since there is an exchange of one type of ownership and uh, what to say but it was within the period of 12 months less than 12 months period that will not make you ineligible for participation exemption still you can claim because in exchange of uh, preferred shares you got ordinary shares so that will be treated as continuation of the ownership by way of exchange of one type uh, by way of exchange of ownership interest um, with different types of ownership interest so that will make the uh, participation exemption uh, criteria for a period of 12 months being eligible uh, being continued we are going to publish a detailed analysis on other conditions also on the participation exemption with respect to the corporate tax law, the explanatory guide and the ministerial decision. So we will be sending it to each and every one of you. And also yes. adding to that, uh, the participating interest is pointing towards the capital gain or you know, the dividend income, revenue from dividend or revenue out of dividend. See, these are the, the impact on the corporate taxes. So is it taxable or not? Local dividends, the, there is already an announcement that local dividends are exempt. Uh, dividend or similar, you know, revenue. Similar revenue yes. is going to be exempt. But capital gains are subject to purely based on the participation rule. Participation exemption rule, which is, uh, this is what Girish was trying to explain thoroughly. This is a long topic. So 5% is the minimum criteria of 4 million grams of value, you know, is the cap fixed for assessing whether you are holding a participating shares or interest into the entity or not. If we hold that, capital gains and the dividends are going to be uh, out of the tax. There is no, uh, it's not going to be taxed if the, 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 the share of the participating interest exceeds 5% or if it is more than 4 million. So most of the company in the country, in the Emirate, we have seen that either the dividend income or capital gains are, you know, quite common phenomena in the country and then uh, so we have to be careful in, in you know making sure that we fall into the participating interest for claiming the exemption from the corporate taxes on, on these two headings dividend income and uh, capital gain taxes so this is going to have a substantial impact on the, on, the, on the financial statements of the company if you don't have that you know interest substantial i mean participating interest percentage so we have to relook again all the investment ensure we can claim the exemption or is it going to be taxed or not taxed based on the, the percentage of holding or the value of the holding as of now? That is the, the, the assessment to be done at this stage with related to this uh, specific topic. Yeah, absolutely correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. J.K. So another decision, which is again, very important, the adjustments under the transitional rule. Now transitional rule means transition from the pre-tax period to the post-tax period. So uh, for companies whose financial year is 
Jan to December for them. First Jan 2024 is the effective date of corporate tax. So before that period will be called as a pre-tax period. After first June, first Jan 2024, it will be known as the post-tax period. So when you're transiting from the pre-tax to post-tax period, there are certain items which we need to evaluate and uh, have a proper understanding. That focuses on three areas: the immovable property, the intangible assets, and the financial assets and financial liabilities. Now, again, this area requires a detailed uh, study, but the summary is certain kind of adjustments is allowed in this three category of uh, what to say uh, uh, listings that we have given as per the law, as per the ministerial decision. So certain taxable income, certain adjustments can be made to the taxable income based on the recognized gain or loss of the respective type of asset. So actual at the time of actual sale or disposal of any of the different types of asset whatever gain we are whatever gain we are getting that gain again certain adjustments can be allowed to that gain because uh, pre tax uh, period whatever tax implication or whatever the change in the value whatever the increase in the value of the asset which would have realized on a which would have given rise to a virtual gain that will be eliminated from the actual gain so this is to give a relief to the uh, taxable persons who would be subject to certain type of uh, transactions when it comes to disposal of immovable property or an intangible asset or financial assets and liabilities. So taking uh, the example of real estate transactions in UAE, uh, real estate transactions uh, you know, are of very high prominence even the individual owners of the company have real estate property in their name. Uh, the company's own real estate property, real estate business is very huge in number. So they should be focusing on this area wherein it specifically mentions the amount of gain, how we have to calculate that. And we need to exclude that gain from the actual gain at the time of the disposal. So how to calculate the amount of gain which needs to be excluded from the gain that is actually earned, realized gain at the time of disposal, that is what we are looking at here. So this specifies that at the beginning of the tax period, we need to have an understanding what is the uh, gain that would have arisen at the beginning of the tax period, what gain you would have got if the asset or the real estate property is disposed of at the market value and the cost. So basically how, what is our gain? It is sale value minus the cost. So sale value here is trade, uh, treated as market value and market value should be as determined by the relevant government competent authority. That again, we need certain clarity on that. Who are the relevant government competent authority who can give proper market valuation of real estate properties. And the cost will be, what to say, uh, the higher of the original cost and the net book value. So whatever the original cost is, and what the current net book value is, we have to calculate. The higher of that will be taken as the cost of the immovable property. The difference between the market value and the cost will be considered as a gain at the beginning of the tax period. This gain is what we will be deducting from the actual value. So the, in summary, whatever gain is, uh, what to say, virtually recorded or unrealized gain in your books, that will be treated as a set off or an adjustment against your actual gain which will be a good amount of relief to the uh, 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 companies entering into uh, transactions where the real estate properties are disposed of. Another method is also prescribed wherein we need to calculate the proportionate gain before the pre-tax period and after the post-tax period. And then that amount of gain can be excluded. So there are two options given, either options we can select and then the adjustments can be done to the actual gain. Financial assets and financial liabilities. This is also very important. Uh, financial assets and financial liabilities will be is already categorized as per the relevant accounting standards or the IFRS, and we need to follow that. So any adjustments to that, what, what is the amount of adjustment required at the time of realization or at the time of, uh, what to say, disposal of such financial assets and liabilities, that also is stated in this ministerial decision. So this area we need to focus on along with uh, immovable property, intangible asset, financial assets and financial liabilities are also taken into account when we are, when we are considering the transitional uh, provision 
uh, from the pre-tax period to the post-tax period. So, uh, Mr. J.K., would you like to have any insight or give an opinion on this? Uh, yeah, this is already, yeah, Girish, you already explained about the topic. See, this topic seems to be a little complicated because it's recently announced and we are now decoding it. But the, the, the primary, uh, the initial understanding is what Girish explained. The impact is not clearly visible now because the problem, uh, the market value, the, 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 the point which Girish was trying to say, the market value, who can assess the market value is one question. So is it practical to get a market value of many of the uh, financial assets, financial liabilities, or the immovable property or intangible asset, whatever? See, that is going to be the, the, the challenge See, because market value, ma assessing market value is one of the challenge as on the first day of the tax period. That is going to be 1st of January, 2024. If our financials are December, January, December period. Or if it is a June, July or July, June, now, uh, tomorrow is going to be the, the, the deadline. Yeah, so that assessment is a, is a challenge, number one. Number two, and the first two sections, immobile property and the intangible assets talks about gains or losses. But the financial assets and liabilities are talking about gains and losses. Both. No, I mean, I'm sorry. The first two parts, immobile property and intangible assets are talking about gains only. If you carefully read it, it's, it talks about gains. Any gains can be adjusted towards the below. A, B, C, D, certain conditions, uh, conditions are explained. But the, the third one, financial assets can be adjusted for either losses or gains. So that is also a bit uh, tricky. Uh, and we are just analyzing it. What is the, 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 the impact going to be in the financial statement? Mostly in this country, in Emirates, the real estate, since Grisha was trying to explain, real estate is a dominant transaction. And uh, since it's an immovable property, the gains on sale or the actual realization is going to be taxed. Say any sale happening in 2024, which is having you know a profit, is going to be taxed. Automatically, this is going to be taxed. So there are going to be some deductions based on this computation. This is what this 120 of 2023 talks about. So um, that is based on the first day of the financial year and the market value should be fixed. And then see this computation is a challenge. I'm telling you that that is going to be the challenge uh, going forward because this will have a huge impact, especially when we have a real estate property in the balance sheet or, you know, intangible assets. Financial assets, financial liability is quite clear because it talks about gains and losses. So the adjustments need to be done. And mostly we do have an impairment mechanism. We have a fair, fair value mechanism based on the IFRS and we do recognize it. So most of the balance sheets and the opening balance sheets are already having that market value based on the fair value analysis. That is going to be clear. But other way, since it's not mandatory in some cases that we don't need to do the valuation for the intangible assets and for the, 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 the immobile property, Fair value, yes, I agree. But market value, we don't have that habit of doing it in most of the cases. That is going to be a challenge. Otherwise, it's 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 a you know a, a topic which give relief to the taxpayers in general. Thank you, thank you, Mr. J.K. Now, this uh, ministerial decision one twenty six was released yesterday. This uh, talks about the general interest deduction limitation. So if everyone uh, recollects or uh, through various channels, you might have known that interest deductions is allowable up to 30% of the EBITDA. Uh, so if you are incurring X amount, X into 30% will be allowed in the current period. The remaining 70% can be carried forward up to a maximum period of 10 years like that. that those conditions are there. It has been made more clear. Now, this net interest expenditure where the deduction is allowed where the general interest deduction limitation will be applicable is where the net interest expenditure is more than 12 million. So first we need to calculate net interest expenditure of the taxable person. If it is less than 12 million, then the limitation will not be applicable. You can claim 100% as the deduction. If it is more, if it is 12 million or more, then the 30% of the EBITDA will be applicable. So now, what all will be considered as interest? So if I have taken a loan at a rate of 5%, what I'm paying as 5%, that will be interest, of course, yes. But apart from that, any fees in connection with the finance on which we are claiming the interest, any guarantee fees, any arrangement fee, any commitment fee, maybe processing fee is considered as arrangement fee. That word processing fee, which is widely used, is not used here. So we believe that that also will be included in this. So any fee, which is in connection with the finance on which we are claiming the interest, that also will be considered as interest, any fees. And any interest component on the forward contract, future contract uh, options that we take, 
any swap contracts that we enter into, any financial in instruments that is used as a hedging that is connected with the raising of the finance. Some person when they raise finance because of the interest rate fluctuations or anything, they may be doing a hedging or maybe over a period of time with the uh, clearance of the with the uh, disbursement of the finance, the interest rate varies on certain disbursements. So to protect against that, a hedging instrument may be taken, and on that hedging, they may be incurring certain expenses that also will be considered as a interest. So all those interest component need to be listed down where the, such interest expenses are incurred, and that will be take, uh, taken into consideration while calculating the net interest expenditure uh, figure. Even all the foreign exchange gains and losses accruing from the interest. So for example, if we have taken a loan from outside and we are paying the interest to outside, but then there is a foreign exchange gain or loss depending on the currency conversion translation rate, such gain or loss will also be considered as a part of the interest pertaining to that interest amount, not to the loan amount, the interest amount. Two important areas that we need to decode is, uh, what are the, uh, the interest payment on finance lease and non-finance lease? Now, coming to the finance, uh, finance lease payment, the finance element needs to be uh, taken out from the, the finance lease payment. So with the full finance lease payment workings, what is the principal component, what is the cost component, and what is the finance component that needs to be bifurcated. And the finance element needs to be taken out while we are considering the net interest expenditure calculation. When it comes to non-finance lease payment, uh, we need to have a understanding here whether the non-finance lease means operating lease or not. Uh, generally in accounting standard, there are only two type of lease, uh, finance lease and operating lease. In tax law, they have used the word non-finance lease. So does non-finance lease mean operating lease or not? We need to have a better clarity on that, which we will be letting you know in the coming days. So in that, the finance element needs to be taken out as a proportion of the total cost of lease to the uh, whatever finance element, total finance element is there that needs to be divided by the total cost. And that ratio needs to be applied to the lease payment. That's how we are going to take the percentage and that will be applied on the lease payment uh, uh, figure to arrive at the finance element. So this, this two workings in, is done in finance lease payment cases and non-finance lease payment cases to arrive at the figure which will be applied for net, net interest expenditure calculation. So this is a very important uh, ministerial decision which was received yesterday, which reads further analysis and detailed analysis will be given uh, in uh, future, in the coming days. Ministerial decisions, we have not, we have covered most of the important cabinet uh, ministerial decisions except uh, two uh, and what was released, uh, the three released today. Now the cabinet decisions. One, imp one important and very simple cabinet decision, but it is very important to have an understanding on this, is the determination of amount of annual income subject to corporate tax. So, so everyone knows that if the taxable income is less than 375,000, which is basically the adjusted net profit, is less than 375,000, the corporate tax rate is going to be 0%. Again, as mentioned in the small business relief, if any artificial separation of business is done to bring down the taxable profit below the threshold, just for the purpose of gaining the 0% tax advantage, GAR provision will be applied, the, which will be subject to the tax assessment by the tax authorities and the tax auditors. And taxable income above, that means the adjusted net profit above 375,000 will be subject to 9% corporate tax. This was the purpose of cabinet decision 116. Cabinet uh, decision 49 uh, is very important when it comes to a resident or non-resident natural person. This is the talk of the town even now also. Uh, there are certain questions which are still there in everyone's mind, which we'll be discussing in the coming slide. So if a natural person, resident or non-resident, through a business activity is earning less than 1 million, then uh, if it is earning more than 1 million, that will be considered as subject to corporate tax. That person will have to get registered, will have to obtain tax registration number, file their tax returns and everything. Below 1 million, the person is completely exempted from uh, corporate tax, nothing has to be uh, done. Now, whatever business or business activity he is con uh, conducting, that needs to be considered for calculating the 1 million taxable limit. That 1 million will not include a wage as in salary or any other sort of uh, recurring revenue in the form of employment, whatever is earned, any personal investment income, 
any real estate investment income. Now, the third category, real estate investment income, is the debate where it is happening most of the time. So, for example, if a person is earning a revenue of 1.5 million, we will say, okay, he will be subject to corporate tax. But then we have to divide how much from business activity and how much from non-business activity. So from business activity, if the revenue is only 900,000, which is below the 1 million threshold, then that person will not be subject to corporate tax compliances. So, and the remaining amount may be some real estate income or a personal investment income or an employment income. So that will be disregarded for the purpose of uh, evaluating whether the person will be subject to corporate tax or not. The most important questions that is going on as of now, for example, a natural person, if is a person is an individual, is owning a real estate property and earning rent and income, will that be considered as a business activity? So Mr. JK, I would like to have an opinion. What are the uh, discussions that we do, of course, internally frequently have, but what are the opinion that is coming from the market when you are talking to external parties? See, these are question marks. Again, you can see on the slide. Yeah, <laughs> all one, two, three is under question mark, which means, uh, it's not very clear from the from the ministry that you know what are the what are classified as a business under real estate category when an individual is you know concerned in terms of an individual is concerned what when is going to be a business we we were trying to read the law on what is a business you know when uh, and and also it talks about you know license a person who conducts any real estate activity in the country who is supposed to be conducted through a valid license is going to be business. That is what the law says. So what are the activity under the real estate activity for an individual which require license? Yeah, that is the, the point where we need to be careful now. When we analyze it, currently the practice in the country is that individuals who own property in UAE and then they either they buy, sell it, or they buy it and then lease it out or rent it out. You know, there is no specific trade license or any activity or license from, from any of the authority to conduct those businesses. We get the check or we get the rental in our personal account. You know, that has been, uh, of course, this is subject to VAT, but this is not considered as a business as of now because there is no license. So is that mandatory that we should process a license for this activity or not? That is the question. But since the market says that there is no license available in, in, for these kind of activities, that is a question mark. Now, another topic to be discussed is uh, the same real estate transaction, the same transaction, uh, conducted by an individual if it is through a license say mostly we can see the transactions are parked through a company yeah i own some property and then my company either i own 100 percent or my you know company or i am partnered manage my property yeah rentals are booked in the company or rentals are booked by me the company booked the management fee so what are the scenario what what, what is this is going to be what this transaction is going to be taxed the the the, the law is very clear that any real estate transaction you know, conducted by an individual or a natural person, if that requires a license to be conducted and, and whether that activity is to be conducted through a valid license, and those kind of transactions are going to be taxable. So we are just trying to get more information from the authorities and the ministry on those topics, because this will have a huge impact on the transaction you know, conducted by an individual in terms of buying and selling of real estate activity. See, the, the investment, investment is out of scope or uh, these are not subject to taxes personal investment are not subject to so what is investment what is a business that bifurcation needs a bit more clarity that is why we use this question mark in this slide and uh, debates are going on in the market that you know some people uh, interpret it as a business when an individual conduct in, in the normal course of you know day-to-day -day operations he is having multiple property multiple business segments then that is his occupation that is his you know major source of revenue so those are the trigger points where you know uh, this might attract corporate taxes, but maybe FTA will address it or the ministry is going to address this question through a separate cabinet decision or a ministerial decision later, because this is going to touch most of the companies in the country. So that's, that's it. So as of now, it's a bit confu confused whether this is going to be considered as a business or not for the corporate tax purpose. When this is conducted by an individual, I'm talking about as a corporate, yes, it is taxable. But uh, the question is on the natural question. So just one question. So if a natural person in the form of a sole establishment, yes. a natural person in the form of a sole establishment is also treated as a natural person only because we have to club all the entities as a sole establishment into one group and then we have to report to the tax authorities. So if the real estate transaction, for example, renting of the property is done through a sole establishment, will that be considered as a business activity? Because sole establishments, I'm not talking about sole establishment LLC, sole establishment 
sole proprietorship is treated in par with natural person so will that will that be considered as a business activity see the the law clearly says that if it is conducted through a license or if this is required to be conducted through a license either conducted through a license or which is required to be conducted through a license that is the terminology that you used so since your your question was if it what if it is conducted through a sole proprietary license sole proprietorship is a license issued by the authority dd yeah, yeah so it's yeah. a license of course it is going to be taxed if the same revenue is booked through a sole proprietary concern in the country because that is carried out through a license no question the question or the doubt is only when there is no license from dd and still you are conducting the activity if it is booked through a company definitely this is going to be taxed uh, but again the questions are there are few cases in real estate segment that company sole proprietorship company does not book the rental income rental income directly go to the owner yeah and the company book only the, the management fee what are the the, the complications involved on that is also a, a topic where we need to discuss further rent check is issued towards the company uh, towards the individual name whereas the management is conducted by this license so in my view or in our view what i feel is uh, substance of this transaction is everything is conducted by an individual directly instead he is using or, or taking an assistance of a company to conduct this activity that's it in in, in reality or in legal terms he is the owner he is uh, collecting the rental everything remains in his name so that is going to be uh, and since that is not mandated by any license as of now that is going to be out of scope by reading the existing rules and regulations uh but imagine a scenario the same revenues booked in the company in the name of the company rental checks are coming and then booking in the company bank account yes it is going to be taxed in the company because that is carried out to a company that is what my understanding okay thank you thank you mr jk it uh, this is the area where the debate is still going on and many of the uh, companies clients they have the query on this and still we, we are waiting for certain clarifications maybe Uh, the private clarification option will also be open once the corporate tax uh, uh, decisions are fully out so at that time we will have to see whether we can obtain a decision on this or not so now coming to the fta decisions fta decisions uh, three decisions are published one is conditions for change in the tax period now tax period can be uh, change maybe at the time when the taxable person is going under liquidation or for aligning their financial year with the financial year of their uh, what to say other group companies when they want to create a tax group so ta for creating a tax group one of the one of the conditions is uh, all the companies must be following the same financial year so to follow the same financial year and to be a part of the tax group they may uh, want to change the financial year or they may want to change the financial year to be in line with the head office uh, or the parent company that is that may be in the jurisdiction may be outside the jurisdiction so all those factors needs to be considered all that uh, reasons has to be there valid reasons has to be there for why we are applying for change in the condition a uh, change in the tax period that tax period can be extended to either 18 months or it can be reduced between somewhere between 6 and 12 months so for example if a company is following a tax year but they want to be part of the tax group and then they want to change the tax period such change should be either uh the change can result only up to the tax period being for 18 months or less than 12 months up to 6 months so that's where we have to look into when we are applying for change in the tax period and only for that range we can apply for change in the tax period tax de registration timeline is very simple uh, like in uh, vat there is a registration de registration applicable for the corporate tax also so when it comes to de registration both for natural person and for the juridical person that is a legal person 3 months 3 months with the stop with the cessation of the business activity natural person must apply for a tax de registration application similarly for a legal person within 3 months from the date the entity stops to perform any business activity goes into liquidation or dissolution process will be uh, the de registration application must be submitted in case of late de registration what is the penalty whether the tax procedures law will be invoked is not clear which will be coming in the future which will be coming in the ensuing maybe in the future uh, cabinet decisions or anything it should be out this again provisions for exemption from corporate tax now exemption again there were certain entities which we discussed earlier were completely out of the corporate tax that means they did not obtain uh, registration itself here we are talking about companies who can who must take registration but can claim an exemption so a qualifying public benefit entity 
uh, as per the article 4 qualifying public benefit entity is coming under the exempt category but this person must obtain a tax registration number so as of now 1st october 2023 uh, the cabinet the qualifying public benefit entity must obtain a tax registration uh, number similarly a qualifying investment fund must obtain a tax registration number by 1st june 2024 this qualifying investment fund again will be entitled to apply for exemption from ct but may be but they are required to file an annual declaration they may exempt they can further go and apply to the tax authorities to make them completely exempt from corporate tax but then again there will be certain declarations that we have to submit to the tax or they have to submit to the tax authorities and the and on the approval of that application only they will be completely exempt from the corporate tax compliances the same is applicable for public pension or social security fund and private pension or social security fund they have to obtain the tax registration number as of 1st june 2024 all this category of persons the pension fund social security fund and the qualifying investment fund they must have a trn number within the deadline now free zone persons this is a very hot topic no cabinet decisions are out on this as of now Uh, in the explanatory guide they have clearly specified that the cabinet decisions will be published so we are still waiting for that just to touch the area free zone persons who are eligible to be categorized as a qualifying free zone person on their qualifying income tax rate will be 0% on their non qualifying income tax rate is going to be 9% what is qualifying income no definition is provided as of now again that is expected in the cabinet decision one important area that we need to look is a free zone person needs to be first categorized as a qualifying free zone person then only they will be eligible for a 0% tax rate now to be categorized as a qualifying free zone person there are different conditions one of the important condition the first condition that they have stated is to maintain adequate substance what is adequate substance is not defined in the corporate tax law in the cabinet decision they may be publishing but then we need to assess what is adequate substance as of now from the economic substance regulation point of view so in the economic substance regulation article 4 they have clearly stated what are the parameters which will give a adequate substance to a company performing relevant activities as per the economic substance regulations in the ua this parameters can can be applied for the free zones also but again we have to wait for the cabinet decisions to be out but these are the key parameters that needs to be focused on if substance proving is required when it comes to free zone persons mr jk uh, been uh, uh, what to say a prominent leader when at the time of uh, esr imp imp implementation came in ua you were a part of the team of hlb hamt uh, for assessing the esr guidelines you know evaluating the different relevant activities the uh, different uh, parameters so please let us know how the substance test can be carried out for a free zone persons with respect to the uh, esr guidelines yeah i will quickly go through grief because we now we are running short of time we have to give some good time for the q and a answering see the the esr is not directly connected to the corporate tax regulation these are different topics this is 2019 and we are talking about 2023 so the, the this is a four years back low see why we talk about esr into this platform is to you know you know discuss about what are the conditions uh, for proving the substance in the country uh, that is been announced by the economic substance regulation so if this is the conditions to be followed or these are the conditions to be followed by the ministry for assessing a free zone entity for substance test yes we have to be careful because this is a detailed explanation of how a company can be uh, you know established themselves as 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 a economically substance like they have proper substance in the country or not which which is a broad topic mostly it say that the important topics are it should the license is directed and managed in the country in the emirate that is the first topic license is directed and managed in the country then the other rest of the points are there should be a proper board meeting board meeting should be managed out it should be recorded properly there should be enough and sufficient manpower resource in the country or you should be able to outsource to a company and the outsource company should have proper substance and then you should have a proper asset base in the country you know you should have proper sufficient and proper asset base in the country so these are the main topics to be assessed to ensure that whether you have a substance or not 
so all this depends on specific conditions it is specific scenario of the company so many of the companies in the uae who are operating in the pre zone offshore does not require an office space to operate it that is a problem so they they can even manage this company without even a proper substance so is that permit or not so what is adequate what is not adequate is a debatable topic if if i to myself that i can conduct my business even without the proper you know physical staff physical office space physical assets in the country is that adequate or not if that is adequate yes we can continue uh, doing that and we can uh, you know control it from outside but if the law say otherwise then then this is going to be a challenge a, a company small entity operating in the pre zone uh, say pre zone entity or an offshore entity and and all the entity should have a proper and and valid and physical substance in the country is going to be a challenge for most of the company who are have, operating in the in the pre zone with uh, you know this kind of license virtual license kind of thing and that is a challenge so we are awaiting the law further law on 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 the economic substance or the substance to be proved if you qualify for a pre zone company as a, as a qualified pre zone and then then qualifying income so that's it so that is a, a, a topic which is still under discussion which is not you know finalized from the ministry we are awaiting the any 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 cabinet decisions on that thank you thank you mrs ek on that on the economic substance test criteria yes thank you for that place of effective management again uh, this concept is not specifically uh, conceptualized in the corporate tax law but through article 113b where they state that a juridical person that is incorporated or otherwise established or recognized under applicable legislation of a foreign jurisdiction that is effectively managed and controlled in the state the reason i read the line as is it is it is from the law that we have quoted this says that any entity that is incorporated outside or under the jurisdiction of a foreign company a foreign country but that is effectively managed and controlled in the state what is why we are looking into that so if the corporate tax law has introduced this article that means they are looking into the poem the place of effective management application for entities that are been controlled from uae so why why poem why why are they looking into that aspect let the company be registered there they are reporting there for example if a company uh, if um, some if, if a company is there in ua and uh, the same shareholders or the management is having another company in india or in egypt or in saudi so they need to see you know uh, why the poem the poem implicates that the management or the company is com controlling the entity in the foreign jurisdiction from ua so the place of effective management an enterprise having many companies can uh, will be having management for each and every entity so for example if we have a group with five entities five entities will be having a management to manage that company but the place of effective management will only be one so the effective management is a very important area that we need to look into so what is effective management we will be discussing in the coming slide so why poem is been implemented by the tax authorities or the ministries and this is not just in ua across the world uh, the, wherever there are uh, transparent tax structures poem is been implemented so assessing the possibilities of companies incorporated outside ua but controlled and effectively managed from ua by that what the tax authorities try to understand is whether companies are managed in low tax jurisdictions or in any other tax jurisdictions from uae then they should be reporting that income or reporting that revenue in uae what are the parameters of determining poem how we will assess or how we will judge that a poem exists in uae or not the place of meeting of board of directors the place of senior management for example if the senior management is in uae and then they are controlling the company across different tax jurisdictions that can give rise to poem place of taking key management decisions operational or commercial decisions are taken from ua then that can also create a poem place of maintaining key accounting records and relevant documents including financials agreements from where it is prepared is consolidation happening here that can also be a parameter for deciding whether the poem ex exists or not one quick case study before uh, we, our time is running out a danish company whose ceo is a norwegian ceo from norway that ceo was working from home two weeks or three weeks a day 
so a uh, company is in De denmark but then uh, two or three week two or three days he used to work uh, from uh, home in norway being the ceo of the company he is one of the key management persons or a senior management person who involves in operational commercial decisions the norwegian tax authority said that the danish entity has a place of effective management in norway so they must get registered in norway because the person who is key management who is taking key management decisions or involved in key management decisions is located in norway most of the time so place of effective management will give right uh, must be norway of that entity and that entity must get registered so this is the area that we need to look into very uh, strictly moving forward and what are the key points uh, that needs to be considered by the entities for whom poem may be applicable or when they assess that okay whether poem is applicable to or not one important thing is for example uh, entity in india entity in uh, uae and the common the management is common everything is every decision is taken from here so what will poem give rise to poem will give rise to clubbing of the revenue generated from the indian entity to be clubbed with the uae entity and then we have to report it to the tax authorities here but then if you report you have to pay the tax also but you are not going to pay tax two times in india as well as in uae so then we need to see whether there is a double taxation avoidance agreement or a treaty double taxation treaty with india or not if it is there then we can take the uh, we can uh, adjust we can, or we can take the tax credits uh, available to certain extent or based on the tax treaty between the two countries so all that assessment needs to be done or uh, what to say based on the tax treaty evaluation whether any tax credit can be taken or not how to file the tax returns whether we should be Uh, that entity anyways will have to get registered here so whether we should be clubbing the tax return or we we need to create separate tax returns we need a better clarity on that an assessment needs to be done how many entities are being controlled from the key management person or the senior management who are located in ue we have seen cases where a, a person is controlling more than 100 companies across the world by being a resident of ue so in such cases the place of effective management will come to ua all the consolidation will have to be done in ua and then necessary returns has to be submitted to the tax authorities dealing with the tax treaties of different countries where the different tax jurisdictions where the different entities are located all this needs to be evaluated so this is a very important area that we need to focus on uh, mr jk would you like to highlight anything on the poem part yeah poem uh, you already explained uh, see this is an important topic especially when the the, the company owners are concerned see company to company control would be one parameter but mostly in ua what i have seen is you know the company owners the, the managing directors or the owners of the company they resides in ua and then they manage other multiple entities across the globe so when they manage the other company and then 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 you know he is a resident of ua that is called the you know poem then if it is an effective management then we need to be careful careful in the sense see the tax impact needs to be assessed what is going to happen is this foreign income needs to be disclosed in ue when i say disclosed uh, you know if it is already tax paid country high tax paid country there is no tax impact in the country but what if you know somebody control an entity in in low tax country low tax jurisdiction like say currently in gcc bar in or in you know tax havens like bahamas panama bva seychelles those regions and then this company is completely effectively controlled by sitting in ua then then this is going to be a challenge because as per the law as per the place of effective management law this needs to be taxed in in emirate so that is going to be a big impact for those who operate the company uh, from ua and 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 uh, and if that falls within the definition of effective management that's an important terminology what is effective management needs to be carefully analyzed so that is going to be a challenge but this is going to be a big impact for for own business owners who resides in ua and then control other entities outside the ua thank you thank you mr jake but then this is going to be a very important area that every company with having uh, owners located in ua but then having entities or having uh, share holdings in other entity where they are substantially involved in decision making an assessment needs to be done a poem assessment needs to be done to evaluate whether a poem implication will be falling on them Uh, in the tax periods for which they are going to be required to register and file the tax returns so that needs to be done general anti abuse rule again this is a uh, what to say a provision that they have given uh, about 
restricting certain transactions or arrangement of activity that gives rise to just to tax advantage that cannot be executed. You can do that, but that will be subject to tax assessment by the tax authorities and it can lead to penal implications once that is done. But the crux, the entire, what all types of scenarios will be covered in this that we need to evaluate. Uh, some questions come whether the restructuring uh, after the tax law came, uh, you know, whether we need to create a tax group or not, that assessment is done to create a tax group and we need to create a parent subsidy relationship, whether that can be done by creating a parent company, a holding company, and then the grouping can be done, whether that kind of transactions also will be covered into the GAR or not. We need to be more, uh, we need to have a more clarity on that, but those are the scenarios that we need to look into. So when we are talking about GAR, it is, uh, you know, there are certain limitations already placed in the corporate tax law. Okay, this is avoid, this is deductible, this is not deductible. This is the limit. This is not the, the this is the, this is the limit on certain type of deductions. So there are already targeted tax based protection measures when it comes to limitations on interest deductions, thin capitalization rules. Some companies they may be having good cash flow, but then to take the benefit of uh, uh, what to say uh, corporate tax uh, reductions, they may borrow high borrowings and then they will you know pump in the uh, fund and at interest cost that interest will be taken as a deduction. So you would say why we are taking why we are paying interest on this amount uh, then how can they gain a corporate tax advantage that amount that is received as a loan can be routed through other sources and can be taken as a dividend so all that evaluation needs to be done why the loan is taken for what purpose is for, for what purpose it is taken is it for working capital all this needs to be evaluated when it comes to what to say uh, when it comes to uh, eva evaluating whether GAR provision is attracted or not. So there are already certain targeted tax based protection measures. For example, one of the important areas which is not included here, sorry for that, is connected to payment persons, uh, payment payment to connect payment to connected persons. So wherever we are making a payment to connected persons, that also is uh, instructed to be at a benchmarking to be marked at the market rate. The, again, the how to mark, how to benchmark it, the conditions are not, uh, the method is not out yet as of now. So that also is restriction, uh, restricting the payment to certain level, you know, payment to connected persons need to be restricted at a certain level. You can pay any amount, but the deduction will be restricted to a certain level. So those are also targeted areas where they are not, with, where they don't want anyone to take a advantage by, you know, by just taking the benefit of the law. If anyone crosses that line, they are restricting at that level also. So it's a two barrier you know, to be, uh, to restrict you from doing any uh, tax evasion or falling into the tax evasion uh, bracket. So they are already putting a limitation and over and above that, a general anti-abuse rule is also given. GAR is not specific. It can be different from different, uh, in different tax jurisdictions. Some transactions may be allowed in certain jurisdiction, that transactions may not be allowed in UAE. Certain transactions may be allowed in UAE, which will not be allowed in other tax jurisdictions. So that is a very important area we need to evaluate whether we will be falling into the GAR provision or not if we are doing any activity just for the purpose of obtaining corporate tax advantage. If we are doing anything for, you know, which is practically done to be compliant with the law, to have a smooth functioning of the business, to have a proper structuring, proper accounting and everything, if we are doing with a proper sense of economic reality, then that is acceptable. Just for corporate tax advantage, anything is done, then we cannot. Uh, take it as a uh, what to say uh, transaction uh, which which is legitimate for corporate tax purposes and that will attract the GAR provision. So, Mr. J.K., would you like to have a uh, view on this? I think it's it's clear from your explanation. It's very clear. GAR was the topic. There is no further announcement on GAR. No, uh, it was the earlier announcement, and this is not an amendment. This is what we already explained earlier also. You should be careful in doing any restructuring now. You know, but now in the meaning, uh, since uh, 2022 October onwards, we should be careful in doing any kind of restructuring in license or in the management structure or the accounting practice, whatever, you know, which is leading or, or you know, triggering a point that tax evasion or the, you know, something related to that. The, 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 it's a deliberate attempt to reduce the tax impact. See, that is the only thing. But we have to go through some changes, a structural changes in the organization, and then we should be able to explain that this is not, the, the, the intention is not to avoid the taxes only. Uh, so that is the area also we should do an a analysis and, and evidence in the organization to make sure that if the FTA asks you, 
we should be able to showcase that the reason why are we doing into the restructuring it should not be you know just a tax avoidance mechanism that is what the law says so any action we are taking now uh, in terms of changes structural changes falls under the gar and then we need to be careful on 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 that specific topic thank you thank you mr jk thank you on uh, your insight so yeah now the q and a session is over, now open so before summarizing that uh, what we discussed is just a brief of the ministerial decisions cabinet decisions and we will be following we, this will be followed with many of our write ups and discussion points which would be informing to you and all the updates will be posted to you one thing that we have to we, we are just making you uh, aware is that even ministry of finance in the website if you go you can see that they have specifically mentioned uh the consultants as such should not be providing any wrong interpretation or an interpretation which is in contradictory to the law so whenever you are taking an opinion be it from us be it from anyone uh don't be in a hurry to get an opinion as soon as the cabinet decisions or our law is out uh, we should be having more clarity whenever you are getting an advice from anyone so at that level our focus is to have much clarity on the topic and then advise you instead of you know bluffing or putting you at risk after giving an advice uh, that is not uh, what we follow here we always try to introspect to the detail to relate to the practical situations and then we would be advising to you so uh, we strictly we accept the uh, what to say the guideline that is prescribed by the ministry of finance which is there in their website if you go and see uh, and we will be following that principle we have followed that earlier we would be following now also we wouldn't be interpreting in a wrong way and then giving you the opinion we would be taking our time to understand comprehend the uh, decisions and then we would be giving our opinion so coming to the q and a we have got a uh, few uh, important questions one uh, question that i can quickly take is what is the deadline for registration of companies whose financial year is ending with 31st december 2023 so there is no deadline specified for those companies as such but uh, there was a session conducted by the ministry of finance in the first week of february so in that also they just clearly specify that for such companies until and unless specifically mandated by a way of ministerial decision the registration can be taken any time before the filing of tax returns so you can take the registration now you can take the registration 2024 before the filing of tax returns because you have to log in you have to have a trn number and then you only you can submit the tax registration number Uh, you can only then only you can submit the tax returns so for that trn is mandatory but we suggest to take it at the earliest if you have one company no issues but if you have three four companies and if you are thinking of grouping the companies then you know uh, we need to assess whether grouping is beneficial to you or not which companies to group which companies to not to group so you have to take trn for all the companies and then there is sufficient uh, time taken by the ft also to evaluate the documents and the information provided by us for approving the registration so better you do at the earliest because anyways now or later after one year also the registration is required so better you take it now we have got uh, another question which says uh, regarding poem if i you uh, so mr jk if you can uh, give your valuable yes. input on this if a uae based entity based entities decisions are taken from outside uae then should the taxability priority be with that foreign country and or how to decide who should be taxing that first so the question is uae company it's a resident company in the uae but uh, the key decisions are taken outside the country right outside uae yes yes so the the, the law on poem is one way now it is one way yeah it talks about any company operating out of uae the decisions are taken in this country is going to be taxed in this country there is a law and it does not say that any company operating see the resident companies are con companies are considered as a resident that is what my understanding so company operating in the license in the country through a valid license is considered by default it is a resident company uh, it does the law does not specify that where this control is from because that is depending on see for example a, a, a dubai entity is controlled by somebody residing in uk probably uk will have their own tax structure called place of effective management and that is going to be clubbed there and then what is taxed in the country in in, in our country in emirate is going to be taken as a credit back in uk so the 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 principle says that the company is going to be taxed in the country where it's domiciled that is the fundamental law 
since this company is in UAE and this is going to be taxed in UAE first. And place of effective management is not on UAE company, UAE, this is going to be on the other side, UK side. So first, we'll first tax here. We cannot bypass the taxation uh, on, on, on this particular case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. JK. Thank you on the opinion. We have another question. A group of individuals have given property management agreements to a company. Can that company issue tax invoice on account of individuals and how should this invoice be recorded in the books and individuals books? Uh, I'm not going into detail, but yes, there is a general practice in UAE wherein uh, property owned by an individual or a group of individuals is being given to another property management company. I'm not touching the VAT point of view as of now. When it comes to corporate tax, again, uh, Mr. JK has clearly specified in the explanation whether the rental income derived earned by the uh, group of individuals or the individual will be taxed or not. We need a better clarity on that, whether that will be considered as a business activity or a real estate investment activity that needs to be analyzed. Secondly, the property management company, they would be treated as uh, have conducting a business. So anyways, they will have to get registered whatever the property management fee they are collecting. They will have to record it as their revenue and pay the taxes on that. So regarding who should issue tax invoice and all, that is not covered into the corporate tax part. That is covered into the VAT. We have another question which says, based on the uh, article uh, decision 49 of 2023, natural person business income not included personal investment income, does it include dividend from shareholding? So Mr. JK, would you like to answer that? See, uh, see dividend comes from what? Dividend, see, investment income, real estate income, investment income is out of scope, right? Wages, investment income is, personal investment income is out of scope. I think a dividend, a dividend coming from a personal investment. So that is naturally out of scope. And if it's a local dividend, of course, it is already announcement is there and uh, even if it's going to be taxed i mean uh, i'm not telling it's taxed even if it's going to be taxed uh, it's going to be it, we have to look the other way that uh, participating interest and then based on that only the decision will be taken but i think a, a, a person earning dividend income in uae uh, will be considered as an income out of investment which is going to be out of the scope unless this is you know, uh, conducted as a business, like if that is his occupation or if that is his, you know, the, the whole activity and that's his main source of income, then then we need to look into other side because that is what we were discussing, whether that is considered as business or not. Yeah. Just earning dividend out of some investment is not going to trigger any corporate tax on that. Only this is going to be triggered if it is classified or going to be classified as a business income. What is business income? What is uh, not a business income? I already explained. If it mandates that you should conduct it to a license, yes, it's a business income. If not, these are personal income. So dividend on investments are, at the moment, I assume that these are going to be personal income, which is not subject to any corporate taxes. There's uh, one more question. Uh, we have got over uh, 50 questions as of now, but then uh, we'll be taking some questions uh, uh, one question is, is a branch of a foreign company taxable in the UAE? So Mr. JK, would you like to answer that? What is the question? Branch of a foreign company? Taxable is branch of a foreign company taxable in UAE? See, branch of foreign company, what is the legal status of branch of foreign company? The law specifically mentioned that branch of a foreign company is an extension of the parent. Yeah, the branch is an extension of the parent. So parent is a non-resident company. There is a strategy. So branch in UAE, is not having a separate uh, legal structure, a legal form as per the law. And then parent is considered as the as an entity. Parent is a non-resident. But here the question is whether the branch has a PE in the country or not. If the branch is having a PE, this is falling under a category that non-resident having PE in the country. Non-resident company, non-resident taxable person having a PE in the, in, the, in the Emirate. So which means branch is going to be taxed in this country on those revenue which is gained in the country by the branch under the category non-resident with PE. If this company does not have a PE in the country or this establishment or the entity, the foreign entity does not is still operating in the country without a PE, then this is not going to be taxed in this country. Instead, that is going to be UAE sourced income subject to withholding taxes. So any branches operating in the country with a PE 
is going to be taxed in, in UAE itself. What to do for loss making entities? Uh, loss making entities, uh, they will have to register, they will have to file the tax returns and inform the tax authorities about their taxable income. If loss making entities are there and uh, the, the, the losses can be carried forward, and in case they are making a profit in the future, the losses carry forward can be adjusted against the profit of that company, which is uh, uh, what to say, which will uh, be beneficial for the taxable person. So regi taking registration, filing tax returns is mandatory. There is no exemption for the loss making entities as such. So we will be taking one more uh, question, which says adjustments under transitional rule. So book value before first tax period and market value on first day of first tax period will virtually be the same because at the end of the previous financial year, the book value of the assets would have been brought to the level of the market value. Does it mean there will be no tax benefit? Uh, it is not necessary that the book value before the first tax period and the market value on the first day of the tax period need be same because no one uh, does the market value is entirely different from book value. What you show in the book, market value can be less, market value can be more. For example, real estate property brought at a cost of uh, 10 million, uh, 10 years back, uh, you're written down to zero as of now. So as per your book value, the net book value is zero. But if you do the revaluation or if you take the actual market value from the company and authority, that building may be costing around uh, 15 million as of now, just assuming. So that is more than uh, the return of the book value. So book value and market value need not be seen. That kind of assessment has to be done at the time of uh, the beginning of the tax period, effective tax period. Sorry, the first tax period, the assessment has to be done. What is the market value? What is the book value? The comparison has to be done and it needs to be documented with us so that at the time of disposal, necessary adjustments can be done as per the transitional rule. So this- I think, uh, I think this question, Girish, uh, let me add one point. I think the, the question, the, who, I don't know who asked this question. See, this is a good question. This is based on an assumption that, you know, the balance sheet or the financial assets and liabilities are booked or measured at fair value, you know, on the balance sheet. If that is the case, correct. maybe fair, the, the financial assets liability, you agree. But we're okay. talking about intangible, immovable property, which is not mandatory as per the, for us to be at fair value. Okay. It will be the impairment should be tested. If that is the case, that being the case, impair, if the impairment is done and we are not booking it on a market price, then there is a difference between the market value and the cost price, definitely. So this yeah. is going to impact. So the answer which Girish has given is on an assumption that these are immobile property or intangible assets, whereas if it's a financial assets liabilities, probably, uh, you know, it's already been uh, booked at market price uh, in the financials uh, on the first day of the tax period. Correct, yes. So yeah, uh, that's it from uh, our side. Uh, and thank you for all the participants who joined and who were there for us for this one and a half, more than one and a half hours. Uh, thank you for your support. We would be sharing the record. Sorry, we could not answer all your queries now in this forum, but we are definitely going to look your questions and then we'll share you the answers in, 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 in a very short period of time. We have limited time. So that is the reason we are not able to address all your questions. But any question, even further next level questions, you can always pass to our tax at hlbham.com. We will try to take up and then, then give you a solution for that. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.